Welcome to the Hudson Institute in this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet. Today, we'll be discussing disinformation and the federal government's interest in disinformation and uh, the recently created board. Uh, we have today a distinguished panel of experts to discuss disinformation, uh, not in any particular order. Uh, my colleague, Robert McDowell uh, of the Hudson Institute, Nadine Strawson, former president of the American Civil Liberties Union, and uh, the John Marshall Harlan Professor of Law Emerita at New York Law School, Robert Corn Revere, partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and Michael McConnell, uh, Richard and Francis Mallory Professor and Director of Constitutional Law Center at the Stanford Law School and also senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a former circuit judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, this topic has gained a lot of interest in the past uh, couple of weeks since the announcement that the Department of Homeland Security is uh, setting up a uh, disinformation governance board. Uh, and my colleague, Commissioner McDowell, will tell us a bit about what uh, has been reported about this board, and then we'll uh, have some questions for the panel. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Dr. Furtcott Roth, and it's wonderful to see such a distinguished panel. I'll just try to frame the issue, uh, and I can't wait to hear the, the wonderful discussion that we're going to have. And yes, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think it was actually revealed in an oversight hearing by uh, Congress of uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, with uh, Secretary Mayorkas. Um, but what I thought I would do is it seemed to be a few days after that maybe the administration wanted to sort of just uh, disseminate a little bit uh, more about what it was uh, allegedly intending uh, with the rollout of the Disinformation Governance Board. And that name alone, uh, the governance of information is, is interesting and, and bored. Uh, we have to keep in mind that there is no act of Congress here creating it. Uh, or even an executive order. But according to a May 3rd Wall Street Journal uh, article, the uh, DGB, I'll refer to it as that for ease, uh, is described by the Biden-Harris administration as, quote, an internal working group under the Department of Homeland Security designed to work on countering disinformation that it says poses threats to Homeland Security. Examples cited include misleading information used by smugglers, to persuade migrants to travel to the US-Mexico border and disinformation spread by foreign states such as Russia ahead of the midterm elections. The article goes on to say, administration officials have defended the board saying that it builds on work begun under former President Donald Trump and that it would protect free speech and civil liberties. Prior administrations have for years struggled with how to address disinformation uh, without stoking fears that the, um, the government is censoring speech or eroding democratic norms. The, the article goes on to say that um, it reports on a, a Department of Homeland Security statement after Secretary Mayorkas's announcement of the creation of the DGB. Um, and the uh, statement said, quote, the reaction to this working group has prompted DHS to assess what steps we should take to build the trust needed for the department to be effective in this space, end quote. And the Wall Street Journal went on to report that the additional steps uh, included, and this is the Wall Street Journal I'm quoting, releasing quarterly reports about the board's activities to Congress and asking the bipartisan Homeland Security Advisory Council to make recommendations for how DHS can address disinformation while protecting free speech. You know, gonna delete, edit out a couple more uh, sentences here, but it goes on to say DHS also clarified that the board would focus on coordinating work on disinformation from across the federal government and wouldn't have any quote, operational authority or capability, end quote. The steps came after Republican lawmakers grilled Mr. Mayorkas about the new board in a committee hearing after it was announced. A senior DHS official acknowledged the rollout messaging was bundled and, quote, we did not appropriately prepare for this, end quote. And I think that last part is 
everyone can agree on. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Fritz Scott Roth, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to lead the discussion. I don't think anyone knows exactly what uh, uh, this board will be doing. And uh, I, I think it's, I think the existence of the board is a good reference point, but uh, we have these wonderful experts today that I'd, I'd like to speak about broader issues related to federal government's uh, interest in uh, uh, collecting information and, and what the boundaries are. And, and frankly, just also why has this board uh, captured so much public attention? Federal agencies set up boards and advisory groups practically every day. Uh, most of them, no one really pays much attention to. Why has this one attracted so much attention? Uh, Professor Strassen, would you like to tell us about why this has attracted so much public attention? Certainly attracted my attention and that of others who are concerned about civil liberties, including privacy from served government un unwarranted, uh, undue government surveillance, and concerned about freedom of speech. The first thought that popped into my mind when I read about this agency was Oceana's Ministry of Truth uh, and the infamous government agency in George Orwell's dystopian 1984, which was referred to in a really important United States Supreme Court decision, United States versus Alvarez, in which the court uh, struck down laws that outlawed uh, broadly any false statements or you know, too, too broadly defined false statements that were subject to government sanction. Uh, and the majority opinion said, we do not need in this country Oceana's Ministry of Truth. To be sure, there are certain appropriately narrowly defined categories of intentionally or recklessly false information that cause certain specific harms, such as defamation, which damages reputation, or fraud, which leads to uh, economic injury, or perjury, which undermines the system of justice, these can be punished. But when you talk about such a loose, nebulous, manipulable concept as disinformation, frankly, it smacks of uh, government uh, propaganda and, 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 and seeking to uh, shield us from so-called propaganda, namely opinions or um, uh, policy uh, views or, or uh, analysis, uh, not matters of verifiable, objectively verifiable or falsifiable fact that should be for we, the people, to make our own determinations unfiltered by the government. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Bob Corn Revere, uh, any thoughts? Um, yeah, a couple of things. I think there are two things on which pretty much everyone can agree. One is that the announcement of this board, whatever it's going to be, was completely bungled to sort of <laughs> just sort of make this sort of tantalizing little teaser announcement. Oh, by the way, we have this uh, disinformation board. Um, you know, it, it was no surprise that that prompted a lot of people uh, on the congressional panel to say, go on, <laughs> tell me more. And so it was really mishandled. And to have such sparse information dribbling out at the outset, and we don't have much more now, uh, followed by a sort of a one-page press release uh, within the following week, um, it necessarily has prompted a, a great number of questions. The other thing on which I think everyone agrees is that the name is disastrous. It sounds like the KGB. It sounds like some sort of Soviet era uh, a bureaucratic institution. So it's not surprising that it would have comparisons to Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Um, but the thing that also strikes me about it is the reactions have been polarized the way they have been around many of announcements that we've seen in the last couple of months, where we really don't know what the full implications are going to be. And yet 
that doesn't prevent the sides from lining up and taking hard line positions either for or against. Take, for example, um, uh, Elon Musk's uh, purchase of Twitter and his statement that he wanted to reinstill uh, free speech values uh, to, to that platform. Whatever you feel about that, um, uh, that development one way or the other, instantly you had people lining up, taking hardline positions for or against without even sort of knowing what the implications are going to be or what policies might end up being uh, imposed on Twitter in the eventuality that uh, Musk takes over. Um, and the same thing in this, you had instantly people calling this the ministry of truth without really any details about what it's going to be. And you also had the administration backing off right away saying that uh, there's nothing to see here. It has no operational authority. And so it's kind of a symptom of the polarized times that we live in, that you have this debate roiling out there uh, at the same time that people really don't have enough information on which to base hardline positions. Thank you. Uh, Judge McConnell, uh, uh, Mr. Cormier was just describing the takeover of uh, Twitter by uh, uh, Elon Musk. Um, I assume there's a, a very big difference between uh, curation of content and uh, looking at this information from a private company as opposed to the federal government. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the, the differences between uh, 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 curating information and, and looking at it uh, from a private company perspective versus from a governmental perspective? This is a really great question. Um, here, here are some of the differences, but they don't all line up the same way. Uh, in some ways, uh, government interference is much more dangerous. This is what, what our civil libertarian tradition has, uh, uh, has been uh, focused on uh, because government can punish. Um, uh, the, the social media companies, you know, in theory, you can always go uh, uh, somewhere else and they don't have the power to punish. It's not as a severe a matter. There also are uh, reasons why uh, individual users want some kind of curation function. That is, we don't want spam, for example. We don't think of spam as being a free speech issue, but who's to decide what is spam? You know, there, there has to be a uh, 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 some kind of a, of a standard. There also are some forms of disinformation that I think even uh, us uh, free speech mavens uh, recognize as being problematic, like deep fakes, like the, uh, the, the uh, use of mislabeling of, of uh, photographs and, and uh, uh, faking of uh, footage and, and misrepresentation of who you are so that uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, it, someone goes on a social media platform pretending to be somebody else, either for purposes of effectively libeling that person or of laundering their own uh, positions. Uh, all of that points to a possibility of more, uh, more speech intervention on the part of the social media companies. But there's a way in which the social media companies are more dangerous because the, uh, when the government puts pressure on the social media companies to censor, uh, then the, uh, it, it effectively there's a cat's paw uh, phenomenon that uh, uh, we do not have First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis private companies. And so uh, we're uh, quite helpless. And so if the government is behind it uh, and the social media companies may have no have very little incentive uh, to resist o demands for overregulation, and so uh, the the likelihood of more severe uh, uh, censorship than there would be just from the government is uh, is quite uh, out there. Uh, what I think about this this disinformation uh, governance uh, uh, proposition 
is that uh, we should be very grateful that it was uh, un- rolled out in such a such a ham-fisted way. We should be grateful that it was named this, given it's this totalitarian uh, name, and we should see this as an opportunity, not just to sort of poke the administration in the eye, which does nobody in particular any good, but I think there should be a serious discussion of what the uh, what the role is of the gatekeepers of speech uh, in the disinformation space. That just as the, so Nadine was uh, quoting from the Supreme Court's opinion in the United States against Alvarez, uh, the court didn't just stop at saying, you know, mere falsehood is, is, is not enough of a reason for censorship, but, but outlined certain specific areas that she, she was uh, uh, listing them like, uh, uh, like uh, perjury, for example, uh, uh, where uh, falsehood can uh, be punished. Well, I think we should think very seriously about what are the types of disinformation that social media companies should be uh, alert to. Uh, and um, in my opinion, the, the underlying principle here I'm not actually quite sure about all those answers, but what one thing that I am pretty sure about is that it, when the only harm from disinformation is it may persuade people to vote in one particular way, that that in a democratic society, we should not uh, empower uh, gatekeepers like this disinformation uh, governance uh, uh, commission to... Uh, uh, to stop it, because as as voters and as free and equal citizens, we're entitled to decide for ourselves what kinds of information we're going to be uh, voting on the basis of. I do think that there may be some role to uh, for uh, concern about disinformation when the uh, effects of it are going to be for people to do to, to sort of direct and immediate harm to themselves or others. So, for example. You know, saying uh, you know some bad thing is happening at a pizza parlor in uh, uh, in D.C., causing people to uh, flock there and uh, uh, and and with the potential of doing violence. That sort of thing uh, is a more um, uh, a more understandable goal. But it just seems to me we should view the this ham-fisted creation of this uh, you know Orwellian entity as an opportunity to talk seriously about uh, about this and not just to sort of score uh, immediate uh, points against, you know, uh, how bad it obviously looks. So, Harold, can, can I ask a question for the panel? And I apologize, but uh, the judge brought up an interesting point that maybe the audience uh, would want to understand because the word censorship gets thrown around quite a bit. Yeah. And we have constitutional lawyers who here are far smarter about First Amendment jurisprudence than I am. Um, so the, the notion of private platforms and editorial discretion. So if we all wanted to write an op-ed for the uh, New York Times, let's say, and they don't publish it, that's not censorship. It's a private platform. That's their editorial discretion. Versus the government and censorship, there's the vernacular of censorship, but there's the legal term of art, censorship, as determined by the Supreme Court and others, uh, which that's government action, the state action, right? And the judge pointed out to the government using a private party or, or nudging a private party, it could be a social media platform, it could be a newspaper, or whatever, to say, don't run that op-ed or take that person down off of uh, your platform, et cetera. So I, I would love for the panel just to give a quick primer on that because it actually does flow back to what the DGB's mission may or may not be. I'd love to comment about that because there have been a lot of lawsuits recently that have been making the argument to which Michael alluded that um, the, the doctrine that basically says very few exceptions, only the government is constrained by the First Amendment as well as virtually every other constitutional um, right protection. 
one of the exceptions um, is called variously the entanglement exception or the joint action exception. And the idea is that the government itself should not be able to do an end run around its constitutional obligations by sufficiently coercing or inducing or pressuring or cooperating with in some way the private sector entity so it, it is no longer actually the voluntary action independent autonomous action of the private sector entity but it is sufficiently entwined to use another word the court has used with the government um, that the government should not be able to, uh, again, do an end run around its own constitutional uh, responsibilities. Let's be very clear about it. When the kind of disinformation that has been suppressed, I won't use this, the censorship word because we tend to associate that with government, but the kind of so-called disinformation about elections, about uh, COVID, about other controversies that has been suppressed by social media would be completely constitutionally protected uh, from government suppression. And we've lately seen in the past year a flurry of lawsuits, including a purported class action lawsuit by Donald Trump, one against Twitter, one against Facebook, alleging that the ostensibly private platform decisions to deplatform or to downrank or to otherwise restrict or suppress um, a third party speech on the platform was in fact sufficiently involved with the government that there should be uh, an exception to the, the normal bar against suing a private entity. And um, recently, just within the past couple of days, uh, California court dismissed that, ar that, that argument, dismissed the Trump lawsuit, but with um, a, a permission to amend the complaint. Um, just a day or so ago, yet another similar complaint was filed that went into more factual detail in its allegations about the involvement, the joint participation between the government and the uh, private sector platform. And the devil here is in the details. This is an intensely fact-specific inquiry in every situation. Uh, will the facts show sufficient government involvement that we should subject the action to First Amendment constraints? May I just point out that um... You know, while the situation in the United States is very fact intensive, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, uh, the European, both the European Union and the UK are uh, in the process of passing legislation which will openly and, you know, and coercively require the social media companies to engage in more restrictions on speech. Uh, I'm a little surprised at how little attention that has gotten in the United States. And uh, I would think that maybe some members of Congress who are, you know, and enjoy getting on the on the nightly news on this uh, on this ridiculous uh, uh, disinformation governance board um, might uh, cast their eye across the Atlantic to uh, to, to that threat. And by the way, that's not just for Europe. I mean, they can do what they want in Europe, but these social media companies operate on a global basis and it is not impossible that the European standards for speech will be effectively imposed on, uh, on us as well. Thank you for reminding me of a really important factual point that, I, that links together what we've been talking about and the disinformation board very specifically. Um, the latest complaint that I alluded to, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who, I think was two state attorneys general, uh, Missouri and Louisiana, I think, um, that were suing um, various government officials for uh, allegedly pressuring Twitter and, and other uh, social media platforms. And they said it was no, they claimed that it was no coincidence of timing that the announcement of the disinformate DGB um, uh, came hot on the heels of the announcement 
of Elon Musk potentially taking over Twitter with his commitment to free speech. So they linked those two developments as saying, this is in response. They can, you know, the Democrats in particular can no longer rely on, on Twitter, on Musk to do their bidding. Therefore, we need this new government oversight board. Yeah, and, and this illustrates the way in which these, what in the past have been considered pretty straightforward First Amendment questions have come more to resemble a game of three-dimensional chess. You have private control of platforms, which itself has, has constitutional protections and the, the government uh, can't impose its will on directly. Uh, you have uh, government actions that try and regulate those in various ways. And now we have the international dimension that uh, affects all of these, uh, these developments. So also in response to the announcement that uh, Musk was going to purchase Twitter and then come in with new rules, they, they'd be more permissive for free speech purposes. You had European regulators wagging their finger at him saying, Mr. Musk may believe what he wants to believe, but he's got to live by our rules. Well, that carries a number of implications, right? There's that overlap between the decisions of a private platform and how it responds to both overt and covert government pressure. Uh, you also have that international dimension of Europe deciding it's going to impose its regulatory regime in ways that affect the platforms that are US-based. Uh, and, and again, with the Digital Services Act uh, being enacted by the EU, uh, ways in which it affects intermediaries in a way that would not be permitted under the United States Constitution. So um, all of those issues are in play and they're all the fallout of having a global media. No, although Europe is so much less speech protective, it is much more privacy protective. So one aspect uh, in the United States, so one aspect of the new DGB that I think would uh, not be welcome in on the other side of the ocean is increased government surveillance powers, particularly over communications, which are particularly sensitive. Well, that and deputizing what they call trusted uh, sources to issue their own notice and notice and takedown requirements for online content. Uh, that's something that in the United States is permitted in the, the copyright context in which you're dealing with questions of intellectual property. But there you have, at least in, uh, in law, a process that allows people to then challenge those takedown requirements. Uh, here you have uh, a European process that will place the burden on intermediaries to act and take down content and then there may be a process after that. But again, it's very different from what exists in the United States. And it does get into that question of what is a false statement, whether it's something that is actionable under US law, under, under the standards of Alvarez, or whether you're talking about political disinformation. And that's very dangerous in First Amendment terms. Of course, the, the world's largest online market, China, uh, doesn't have any of these protections and, and the government actively uses a social index score. They, they monitor everything that people do online. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate not to, to live under those circumstances. But I, I would like to ask you, is there a federal interest in the concept of disinformation as distinct from other types of information? Is there, uh, what, what is this concept? Uh, and is, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I, I can't really <laughs> articulate what disinformation is or what the, the, the federal interest would be. But if there were, is that something that uh, would be uh, determined by the courts or is it something that Congress would have to write into law? Uh, neither of which is there right now. Uh, cool. any, any thoughts on that? It, it kind of depends on your perspective, doesn't it? Some people call it disinformation, other people call it fake news. And so, you know, if there were some other objective- Other people would call it controversial opinions. Right, right. I mean, if there were some, easily applicable index for that, 
separating what was true from what was false. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think those categories have to be kept very limited and very narrow. Uh, that's one of the things that the court did look at in the Alvarez case. And, um, you know, one of the concepts we tried to uh, put into the mix in the Mika's brief that we filed in that case uh, was where false speech has been punished, it has been accompanied by some kind of harm, either expressly or, or uh, tacitly. Uh, and that is sort of a, a falsity plus concept. Um, if you're talking about fraud, some kind of economic damage, if you're talking about defamation, reputational damage with you know, different levels of, of, um, uh, of burdens, depending on who the, uh, the, defend or the plaintiff was. Um, but to have that for political concepts, as you see in European law, uh, then um, again, it, beca it becomes very dangerous. You've seen a wave of disinformation laws passed by many countries around the world um, in among other contexts in the wake of the pandemic to try to suppress uh, COVID so-called misinformation for the very important purpose of protecting individual and public health. I think uh, we all recognize, I assume, that uh, speech that is not does not satisfy the heart tough standards to be punishable under existing law can still potentially do a great deal of harm. I think um, the concern is that empowering government to have more discretion, more latitude, especially in the political sphere, talking about issues of public concern, can do even more harm, including to the very public health interests themselves or whatever other interest is at stake. Just think of um, how what was denounced as fake news and dangerous health misinformation at the beginning of the pandemic has now been accepted by the very same scientific experts as at least plausible, if not truthful. And, and one would expect that as you have more information, more analysis, that uh, there would be re-examination. Isn't that the scientific yeah. method? Don't we want people uh, to do that? So uh, when you look at how these anti-disinformation laws have been enforced, surprise, surprise, consistently they are enforced against critics of government policies, dissenters from government policies. That happened right in our own country. Uh, shortly after the pandemic started in 2020, Puerto Rico passed two anti-disinformation laws ostensibly, and I'm sure it intended to protect people's health. The ACLU immediately brought lawsuits and got injunctions against the laws on behalf of some investigative journalists who said, you know, anything that is even raising questions any, about government pandemic policies is being punished or threatened with punishment under this disinformation law. And that is not only inconsistent with free speech and you know, democratic governance, self-governance, but it's also actually undermining the search for scientific truth and the best health policy. Commissioner McDowell, uh, for decades, the, the phrase, the marketplace of ideas has animated uh, court decisions, government decisions, dis discussions on Capitol Hill, and even university discussions. Uh, is, is the concept of the marketplace of ideas still alive? Is it something that, that you hear discussed or uh, is it uh, under siege or under threat? One could easily argue it's under threat and whether it's from that governmental nudge that I talked about earlier or private parties, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I hate to use the word collude, but uh, colluding, uh, coordinating to uh, eliminate certain political perspectives. And I'm, I'm focusing mainly on political speech here, but not entirely. Um, the irony here is, and, and Commissioner, you were at the Federal Communications Commission uh, at the dawn of the privatization of the internet uh, and in the, the mid-90s. Uh, and that was celebrated as a time of sort of no rules, free speech, uh, utopia, right? Um, and as the past 25 years have unfolded, uh, 
there's a lot of good out there. You can find a lot of great information, but you can see political speech in, in particular, um, either regulated by uh, nation states, as was just pointed out, uh, or by companies that have an editorial perspective, which under, as we I think all established under our first amendment, they're allowed to have that, but they're not allowed to have that if they're doing the bidding of the state, right? If they're being nudged uh, or somehow colluding or uh, cooperating with the state uh, to squelch uh, free speech. You know, so the internet, I, I've, when I was commissioner, analogized to fire. Fire can do wonderful things. It can give you heat and light, can boil water, can disinfect things, can cook your food. It can also burn down your house and kill people if you don't use it right. So the, the, the internet as this um, sort of hyper-libertarian utopia that I referred to earlier, that's where we were in the mid nineties. And that was kind of the universal political consensus in this country. That was Clinton Gore administration, Quello FCC, uh, uh, doctrine as well of, of looking at it. And that has changed a lot. Um, and this is a debate that we've seen in American history before. I actually, preparing for this, found a quote from JFK. It's a very brief quote. It says, uh, quote, freedom of information is a fundamental human right for a nation that is afraid to let its people to judge the truth and falsehood in an open market is a nation that is afraid of its people. So, I'd love to uh, pick up on something that Judge McConnell said a, a few minutes ago, uh, almost saying, hey, it's a good thing that the GGB came out the way it did, it all bundled roll out and called the DGB. <laughs> um, do we want it to actually try to do something to, you know, so we can take it to court and test it? Uh, uh, what, what do folks think about that? Well, at this point, I don't think there's anything to take to court. I mean, right, right. now. Right. And so there, there's nothing to be tested unless it turns out that this organization is working back channels to try and nudge um, social media platforms to make different kinds of, of policies. But to the broader question of, you know, whether or not there's a marketplace of ideas, you know, I, I also uh, lived through those times of sort of the euphoria of seeing this new medium uh, come into being and, and to, to be seen as sort of the, the embodiment of the First Amendment in its natural state. And we went through this period with the Arab Spring, seeing governments being uh, toppled, and uh, it looked like it was going to be a new birth of freedom and what government was going to be able to withstand that. But as, you know, we have settled into living with this technology, we've also seen governments reimpose control using these ubiquitous technologies. Um, and we've also seen people get uniquely stupid, uh, which makes me wonder whether or not the weakest link in this free speech utopia is us, right? We have for the first time in human history, a technology where in the palm of your hand, you can hold basically the sum total of human knowledge, or you can fact check anything uh, instantly. Uh, you can uh, get access to pretty much the answer to any question, whether or not you're going to get the right answer is another question. But um, the question is whether or not that makes any difference. Has it made our politics any smarter? Um, and, you know, has it made our democracy function better? And I think, you know, we're still trying to figure out what the answers to those questions are. Part of it lies in longer term goals of education and knowledge of media literacy, critical thinking, and, and uh, civics. But I, I think on another level, I saw an analysis recently in a, an, an Atlantic article um, by the psychologist Jonathan Haidt that asks the question why the past 10 years have been so uniquely stupid. And it talks about not moderation choices by social media platforms, but design features that have contributed to the rise of things like Twitter mobs and groupthink. Uh, things like the like button, things like the ability to instantly share an article with thousands instead of, you know, having to reflect on it a little bit uh, or, you know, copy and paste an article if you're going to share it. Those kinds of design features have contributed to a sort of a mob mentality and a group thing that I think are or help explain some of the negative consequences we've seen online. 
rather than looking to try and find ways to ban what people can talk about, uh, but to think about the ways in which information is uh, disseminated and the psychology behind that, and whether or not that contributes or detracts from reason dialogue. Judge McConnell, do you want to follow up on uh, Bob's comments and, and your provocative statements about uh, uh, we should be grateful that uh, this got handled in such a damn fisted way? <laughs> what, what should we be looking for from uh, the, this board? Well, I, I suspect the board is going to be quietly buried because it has been subjected to so much effective ridicule that uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a viable political uh, proposition uh, anymore. So I wouldn't look for the board as to be the focal point. I just think it, it, what it has done is it has put this possibility, this issue of uh, on on the radar screen, so that people are talking about it, people care about it, people have noticed this, uh, and it would be nice if the answer were and really easy. You could just say, "Well, let's have free speech on the platform." And on some days, it looks as though that's what Elon Musk says, but he's going to discover just how complicated uh, this is uh, because. The social media platforms are not like uh, free speech out in sort of a, the ordinary world, uh, because out in the ordinary world, we can only reach a certain number of people. And what is reached is sort of uh, the, 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 the way in which our, our statements and opinions become disseminated is subject to a lot of different filters of various uh, uh, sorts. And the social media companies cannot operate that way because that's not what their users want. Uh, the users do not want to be barraged by everything. What they need uh, in, in a world where there are you know, billions of, of, of potential messages um, you know, on a constant basis, uh, people want their feeds to uh, be directed in some way. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that tends to magnify some things and not others. Uh, there is at least some evidence, although I'm frankly a little skeptical. I want to, uh, I think we need much more empirical work on this, but there's at least some evidence uh, that. Uh, uh, untrue things seem to travel faster uh, than the truth. And certainly that seems that inflammatory uh, material uh, travels uh, faster. That, uh, and thus the social media aren't just, uh, even if you assume that they're not engaged in this sort of quasi uh, censorship activity, they are not, uh, just a, a pure neutral medium. They are affecting uh, the way in which uh, uh, free speech takes place. And as I, I, I very much want to underscore what Bob was just saying, that there may be ways to deal with that on a, on a kind of architectural basis rather than on a uh, on a moderation basis where you say you can say this, you can't say uh, that. Uh, but even that's going to present dangers of, uh, uh, of freedom of speech because who's to decide what's inflammatory uh, and, and so forth. And there are a lot of people who, in, even in the United States and even more uh, elsewhere, uh, who believe that the effects of social media have been so... Uh, damaging that it is you know better to sacrifice some of the civil libertarian tradition in order to uh, in order to, to to prevent that and um, they are going to be very powerful in many places right now in fact I think that they are kind of although they're probably a minority in the United States they're a, a very influential minority. One place where they are especially powerful is within the companies themselves, where the employees provide a powerful um, uh, interest group 
uh, pressure for uh, increased censorship of the uh, of the platforms. Uh, so this information disinformation governance board, um, it, you know, is a kind of a flashpoint. It enables us to think about the problem maybe in a more in a uh, in a way which is different from the usual. Uh, 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 upset about this uh, this alleged disinformation or that alleged disinformation. Uh, but one thing we should be careful of is not to assume that the only dangers to freedom of speech in our culture are those that are coming from the government, because part of the problem is that there is a culture of, um, of uh, intolerance for dissent that is growing uh, I, I see it in universities. We see it, you know, even the, you know, the New York Times is unable to uh, even, even they, they, they actually fired their uh, editorial or op-ed page uh, uh, editor for, for running an op-ed that was unpopular uh, in some circles. So it's, there's a, a general sort of social movement toward intolerance of dissent that um, uh, you know, I, I don't know how this is going to be combated, uh, but it certainly is going to require things other than just passing a magic statute or having some magic uh, bullet. And so I say, let's take advantage of the missteps uh, taken by things like this disinformation governance board to just press uh, in the court of public opinion, press the idea uh, that uh, uh, you know that, that there is a value to free speech, and why uh, the, and why this concept of disinformation is um, is you know car carries with it very serious risks to a democratic society. I wholeheartedly agree with what both Bob and Michael have said. I would like to uh, chime in a bit to, to underscore that as long as we get away from the viewpoint discriminatory concept of disinformation, right? Because it really comes down to a subjective judgment that, well, you know, there's not enough evidence or it's controverted enough, but we're, we're not talking about objectively, uh, you know, intentionally falsifiable or verifiable points of fact. Those can already be, that do harm, those can already be, be outlawed. Um, but once we, once we understand that uh, we are not going to give more power to government, certainly, and I would prefer not to the platforms either, to make viewpoint discriminatory uh, restrictions, then we should be looking at viewpoint neutral uh, measures of the type that both of you have advocated, and I really want to underscore. Uh, one is uh, to, in the, uh, improving the architecture. Many experts say it's already there. I've heard that Twitter is already exploring them. That would promote the ideal of user empowerment and user agency rather than being, you know, the passive objects of whatever these algorithms unbeknownst to us choose to push at us or amplify in our direction that we could at least make some affirmative choices and even if they're relatively broad choices do you want to see pornography even if it doesn't meet the legal standard of obscenity do you want to see violence even though it's protected or do you not want to see it even though it's constitutionally protected and so forth. And um, some experts are saying, you know, there's a technological capability to really have hyper individualized um, offerings, which might, you know, again, then there's the concern about, well, what about echo chambers and filter bubbles? But one of the choices could be, and, and Michael, you refer to studies. Studies show, a lot of studies show that the whole notion of echo chambers and filter bubbles is itself a myth that people who get their information online tend to get it from more diverse sources and more different sources than people who get their information from more traditional media. But that could certainly be an option that we would say we want to see a range of viewpoints. 
On the critical media skills, we absolutely need that because even the you know most uh, draconian ministry of truth is not going to be able to filter out all disinformation. So we need to immunize people against it or give them the tools so that they can protect themselves against it. And here I was really struck, um, you know, going back to your original question to me, Harold, uh, why was there so much concern about this board when it was announced? A lot of the concern had to do with the woman who was named to be its executive director. Nina Jankowitz, because she apparently has um, raised some alarms that she might have a very broad and subjective concept of disinformation. Uh, back in 2017, she wrote an amazing op-ed in the New York Times. To the best of my knowledge, this hasn't surfaced in any media account I've, I've read, um, in which uh, the title is The Only Way to Defend Against Russia's Information War. And, and guess what the only way is? The United States should work to systematically rebuild analytical skills across the American population and invest in the media to ensure that it is driven by truth, not clips. Um, and then in refuting more heavy handed government centric approaches, she concludes by saying any such approaches would contribute to the crisis of trust that makes Russian disinformation successful in the first place. So if she's ever up for you know, hearings to be appointed as, as the head of this board, I would really like to ask her uh, whether she still agrees with, to me, this very persuasive piece from 2017. Yeah. No, that's a, I was just saying that, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and, you know, I just wanted to follow up on that and echo something that Judge McConnell said, and that is, you know, so much of the issues that we have to deal with involve working on us, you know, not so much what are we going to do about those platforms, but the idea of restoring a, um, an ethos uh, of, of freedom of expression, which means tolerating views that you don't like and finding ways to participate in this discussion rather than just having a shouting match across a chasm. Uh, one of the, um, one, I think the, the reaction to the announcement about the board, um, and I agree with the point, we're fortunate that it came out the way that it did, um, was that the sort of traditional sides lined up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, some on the right just uh, recalling the Ministry of Truth and uh, some on the left saying, what are you talking about? There's nothing to see here. And yet, if this had been unveiled in the same way during the Trump administration, how do you think people would have reacted to that? And so we really have to get past this. Well, you you know, and I said the same thing in both administrations, right? Yeah. How, we, we have to get past this instant outrage culture where people automatically, with, with limited information, line up to denounce the other side uh, and simply attack with labels rather than finding a way to actually have a civic dialogue. Commissioner McDowell, uh, you have your ear to the ground in Washington and hear conversations that are going on. What, what are you hearing about, uh, uh, about this board uh, and uh, how it's, it's resonating around Washington? Um, and I think I think Nadine raises a, a very good point. The, the issue is some people raise the identity of the director. I, I'm sure, sure she's a wonderful person. It, it's, it, but you could have Mother Teresa heading up this board, and I think uh, I think we'd all have concerns about the government getting involved in this. Uh, concerns about Mother Teresa getting involved, but that's another <laughs> issue. She's not available right now. But yeah. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, so. If, there has been a fair amount of chatter, but the chatter I've heard thus far has been mainly from center to center right communities or libertarian communities, could be civil libertarians who could also vote left of center. Um, so that's interesting to me uh, it, in that this is a, a thread that, to, to pick up on, I think all of the speakers have sort of touched on this at some point, which is, you know, the, the power is an interesting thing. Uh, and uh, there are some in both parties who uh, 
want the government to have more power to regulate speech as long as it's regulating their rival. Uh, and I used to say um, when I was a commissioner, the most common request I would get just generally uh, was please regulate my rival, but not me. Um, and in the, that's true in the political context, the political speech context, right? So I've seen more concern and maybe it's because it's the Biden administration, which is democratic, um, uh, from the center and the center right so far than the center left. I'm not saying that's exclusively the case, uh, but I tried to, so both my parents were journalists, full, full disclosure, World War II generation, they went to the University of Missouri. They're very much about more than triple sourcing a story before you run with it uh, and things of that nature, which now seem quaint. Uh, but to have integrity in the information you're trying to convey to the public. Um, and so I, I look at things from that perspective. Um, and the concern is that, uh, you know, objectivity uh, is quickly becoming a thing of the past. It, you know, as, as far as journalistic integrity, our, our republic started with papers or pamphlets being sort of partisan rags. Uh, the, the notion of an objective um, journalist is an early 20th century one. And now is the Internet uh, making it so that so we're back to sort of having partisan rags. Um, but. Uh, I would hope that uh, those who uh, are in power right now and in the executive branch would understand that, to Bob Cormier's comment a minute ago, uh, is uh, if this continues to exist and if it does have a governance power as in its name, um, then keep in mind if a different party or a different person uh, is in the White House, will you be so comfortable with having created this deus ex machina for speech regulation? I think the answer would be no. Well, thank you. Um, I promised that we would keep this to an hour. I could go on forever. Uh, any last comments from, uh, from our panel before we close out? If not, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, I think we've learned a lot and uh, we have much more to, to learn going forward. And uh, thank you very much to our panel. Uh, I look forward to welcoming you in person at the Hudson Institute in, uh, in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much.